Hi, this is hypnotherapist John Morgan. What you're about to experience is the most attended stop smoking seminar in the world. I presented this seminar you're about to see to hundreds of thousands of people who wanted to outgrow their smoking habit and get on the pathway to a healthier lifestyle. You will feel the power of hypnosis in helping you outgrow an old, unwanted habit. It will be just like you're in the room with me. I invite you to set aside an uninterrupted hour and 45 minutes and participate in this life-changing seminar. Turn off your phone and any other distraction and let people know not to interrupt you as you watch this transformational recording from start to finish. A couple of notes. I will refer to a tape that you're to use to reinforce the information you absorb by viewing this seminar. Tape was the medium that most people used at the time of this filming. This reinforcement recording is called Calm and Collected, and it's available on this channel, and it's free. After viewing this seminar, go to the Calm and Collected video and use it for reinforcement. It's like putting water and fertilizer on seeds that you've planted to ensure they grow and bear fruit. I also refer to another tape called Self Image. That video can also be found on this channel, and it too is free to you. So now if you're ready, get ready to stop smoking forever. Hi, and thanks for coming. Many of you I got to say hello to, many of you I did not. Uh, we got to say, hi, how are you? And the conversation went something like this. What's your first name? Cliff. Cliff, okay. And Cliff, are you from the area? Yeah. You are, okay. Did you ever live in California? Nope. Cliff, I'm wondering if you're ready to stop smoking. Yeah. Do, does anybody recall me having that conversation with him? Yeah, a few of you, okay. There's a reason that I have that conversation. It's not to get friendly. It's not to get to know you better. It's not are you from Houston, Texas, and you grew up in Williamsport. It wasn't all about that, okay? It was finding out how you say yes and how you say no. That's what I was interested in. So I would ask you a question like your name is Cliff. Yeah. And you're from the area. You never lived in Wyoming. No. And I'm not paying attention to how he says yes, how he says no. That's what I'm doing. Then I ask him the big time question. Are you ready to stop smoking? And you said, yeah. Most people did that. Would you like to see what some people did? Yep, tonight's the night. Absolutely. <laughs> this is it for me. I got a problem with that. There is a part of you that wants to stop smoking desperately or you wouldn't be here spending your time or your money. There's a part of you that's not sure. We want those parts to join together so that there is a cohesive, lined up, you that wants to stop smoking. Because the part of you that's given me, well, yeah, tonight's the night, that's the patterned part of your brain. See, your intellect doesn't smoke. Where's the medical guy? Fred, right? Now, Fred, he's in the medical industry. Fred knows doctors and surgeons and all around the country, right, Fred? No, not all around. Well, enough. <laughs> We made you internationally famous already. You will find doctors who have gone to medical school, have been at the top of their class, then they went to become surgeons and learned how to do surgery and they open people up and they take out diseased organs because of smoking. And after that operation, these very intelligent doctors, he or she, walk outside and light up a smoke. If it had anything to do with intellectual brilliance, they wouldn't smoke, you wouldn't smoke. Some of the smartest people you'll ever meet in your life smoke cigarettes. Some of the dumbest asses you'll ever meet in your life <laughs> smoke cigarettes. It's non-discriminatory. You know, it rains on everybody. You don't smoke with your intellect. 
Nobody says, by God, I think I'm going to set myself up for a stroke and heart attack, harden up my arteries and pollute my lungs and bloodstream. Sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Nobody smokes like that. You don't smoke with your intellect. You smoke with the pattern portion of your brain. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, what's your first name? Teresa. Teresa. Teresa, I'm about to ask you to do something very impolite. Could you remove your shoes for me? Okay, could you put them back on, please? All right, Teresa, since she's been about three years old, has been taking off and putting on shoes, maybe four, I don't know. Every time she takes off her shoes, she takes the left one off first, and when she puts them back on, she puts the right one in first. She's been doing this every day of her life since she's been three years old, and she hasn't a clue that she does that, so I just pointed it out to her. You put on those earrings. Which earring went on first, left or right? That's all right. The right. Okay. Every time you put on earrings, that earring goes in first. Yeah. Did you ever wear, you wear lipstick, don't you? Mm -hmm. Which yeah. lip do you make up first, top or bottom? Yeah. Who makes up the bottom lip first? She's wrong then, right? <laughs> nah. It's just her pattern. What side of your face do you shave first? Well, I ain't shaved in a while. Uh, when you do. Right side. Anybody shave the left side first? Yeah? Okay. It's a pattern. You have a pattern of speech. Oh, we were just kidding over here. When you came up here, honest to God, don't these people talk funny? Yeah. Yes, they do. Be honest. She, she was down south, and she lived in Houston for a while. Come back up here. People talk funny. You go down to Houston, you go, you all talk funny. It's a pattern of speech that you just picked up. You didn't say, by God, I better say my mom by 3 o'clock this afternoon or my mother's going to be disappointed. That never happened. There's a part of your brain that learns without you knowing how that happens. There's a part of your mind that learns without you knowing how. Now, I'm going to demonstrate that to you a little bit later on this evening but I want you to know it up front. You learn without knowing how you learn. That's why hypnosis is so effective in helping you learn a new way, because that's what we're here to do. We're not here to quit smoking. Anybody can quit smoking. You throw your cigarettes away, you quit. How many times have you done it? Three or four. Yeah, three or four, anyway. This program is about outgrowing the old way and growing into a new way. It's about changing up some patterns. See, because you have patterns that run over and over and over again. There's a part of your mind that runs patterns. You don't think about it. Think about when you learned how to tie your shoe. All that effort that went in there, oh, and, you know, and the, uh, I remember the rabbit goes around the tree and down the hole and then the, however you learn. And then this one, and remember, oh, I don't know if I'm ever gonna be able to get that. And then finally, you can tie your shoe, you can yell at the kids, you can do whatever you want and chew gum. You're not thinking about it anymore. It's become a pattern. Smoking is a pattern. It's not your fault that you smoke cigarettes. Nobody started to smoke because they tasted good. Do you remember your first one? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how old you were. Yeah. 13, okay. I was nine. Yeah, I was in the woods with my friend. You asked me if I ever smoked, right? I was in the woods with my friend Bobby Donahue. He had stolen two luckies from his father. Yeah. And uh, Bobby knew how to light them. He was experienced, and he got the match between the thing and almost set the woods on fire. But he lit up the cigarette, and I sucked in. Oh. <coughs> choking, my eyes, my nose, I think I changed a few colors. I didn't start smoking because they tasted good and neither did you. Did I go back? Yeah. I went back and tortured myself. 
so I could learn how to like these things. And why did I do that? Same reason you did. You were going to be cool. Cool. I'm cool. Yeah. Look at me. I can smoke. How about the guys, they blow the smoke rings? And some of the women tell me that they used to practice in the mirror how they looked. How about that? You wanted to be somebody who you weren't. This was going to help you get there. And you tortured yourself long enough to learn how to like them, and then you got hooked on them. I'm here to tell you that your smoking pattern is arrested exactly where it began. Meaning that if you started like I did when you were 9, or you started when you were 12, or you started when you were 15, or 18, or 22, whatever it was, there is a part of your mind that is still that age. That file has never gotten updated. I don't care if you're 100 years old and you started to smoke when you were 10, you are not 100 years old in that part of your mind, you're 10. Let me show you how that works in another area of your life. Who has parents that are living? Okay. Matt, when you were a little Matt, did your mom or your dad have a look they could give you or say your name in a certain way that could almost stop your heart? Who was it, mom or dad? Mom. mom. You're a big guy now. You've gone to school, got your own earrings. You know, got the whole thing going on, right? <laughs> you got bills. I bet you're even a registered voter. You're an upstanding citizen, right, Matt? Can mom still say your name like that? No, not anymore. Not anymore. So you've outgrown that. Well, she passed away, but dad still does. But dad can. Yeah. And you feel how well, big? Actually, now that it's kind of reversed, it's kind of like my brother and I give him the look. Oh, okay. So it's, you got to that part. Yeah. But at one time, yeah. yeah. You understand how that works? Some people can be dead and gone, and you can just think of their voice, and you get the shivers. Or you can think of that look, and it takes you back to a time. See, there's a part of your mind that, how old were you when you started to smoke? 15. 15? Yeah, good. Yeah. So 15. Okay. So I'm about to tell you something that you're not going to believe. The part of your mind that smokes, oh, I'll prove it to you. The part of your mind that smokes is still the same age as when you built that pattern. The pattern gets built just like that. A couple of tries, you get a whole new pattern. If Pavlov, Pavlov can do it with dogs, human beings can certainly do it. Every time you light up a smoke to this day, there is a part of your brain that kicks in and goes, I'm still cool. I'm still one of the gang. I'm still a tough guy. I'm still chic, debonair, whatever your reasons were. And you don't believe that. So let me prove it to you. You smoke Virginia Slims? No. no? You smoke Eves? No. Do you smoke Camel non-filters? <laughs> no. No, not ladylike, is it? No. Oh, where'd you get that idea? You got that idea from the advertising industry. See, these people have you. They know about your patterns. I was in advertising for over 30 years. I know exactly how that works. They're appealing to a part of your brain that's never gotten updated. Every time you light up, they're playing to that part of your brain. You don't think those ads don't work on you? Did you ever see the Marlboro ad, the guy, Independence, Freedom? That guy died of lung cancer, by the way. Yeah, true. There's a buzzword, if guys, if you pay attention here, there's a buzzword with women. It's called freedom. Every woman wants freedom. She can be married to you for a hundred years. She can love you to pieces. Can think you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, a good provider, a good lover, a good husband, a good whatever, fathers. There's a part of her that wants to be free. The advertising industry knows that. So if you see the ads for women, it's your right to smoke. You're free to do it. It's freedom. Yeah. They're playing it to a part of your brain 
that is outside of your awareness that runs all your patterns. The part of you that puts your shoes on the same way, the part of you that shaves your face or puts your makeup on, you do it the same way all the time, it's the pattern part of your brain. That's one side of the smoking equation. The other spot side is you started to smoke and you got hooked on a drug called nicotine. There are 5,000 known chemical compounds in every cigarette. 5,000 that we know about. There are only three that the advertising industry tells you about because that's all they're required to, the tobacco companies. Tar, nicotine, carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, of course, comes out of the tailpipe of your car. That's the one people put in their car and commit suicide with. Okay? Then there's tar. Did you ever get tar, like, on your clothes? You may as well wash the car with that piece of gear. Shout's not going to get it out. You're never going to get the tar off. Can you imagine what it's doing in your lungs? It sits down there. How many of you hack in the morning? Where are the coffers? Yeah, okay. So, did you ever notice that you get up and you start to cough, and that first cigarette <laughs> makes the cough go away? How come Vicks never found out about that miracle cure for the cough? How come that never happened? Here's what's going on. In your lungs, are, I have to check with the medical guy here. There are things in your lungs called cilia cells. They wiggle. The technical term is they move the crap up out of your lungs. That's what they do. Okay? Thank you. And when you suck in cigarette smoke, you anesthetize them, paralyze them. They can't do their work anymore. Then you get six to eight hours of rest, and what happens? They start wiggling, moving the stuff up out of your lungs, you start hacking, and then you stop the cleanup process right in its tracks. So, that's tar. Tar sits there. The good news is, if you haven't done any permanent lung damage to yourself, like lung cancer or emphysema, Ten years from now, your lungs will be on a par with somebody who never smoked. Not the exact same, but on a par. Shade below. That's if you haven't done any permanent lung damage. Nicotine. Now, this is the culprit of the 5,000 that we know about. Nicotine is an addictive drug. It's a psychoactive drug. If you have stickers on your car, at your house in your neighborhood that say, say no to drugs and don't do drugs and you're part of DARE and you're this and that, you're a hypocrite. You're a drug addict. You're smoking cigarettes, you're hooked on nicotine. Nicotine, friends, I can tell you, I work with people who shoot heroin. People who have given up heroin in the hundreds have told me it was easier for them to give up heroin than it was to give up cigarettes. I've done my program at alcohol treatment centers. And people who have given up alcohol have told me that it was easier to give up alcohol than it was to give up cigarettes. If you don't believe that, please go to an AA meeting and see you can cut that smoke with a saber sword. So it's a very potent drug, this nicotine. Very potent. You're a drug addict. I'm talking to a group of drug addicts. Now, I don't care what part of town you come from. I really don't. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care if you travel all over the world. You're a drug addict. If you put other people down for doing drugs and you turn your nose up at them, I got news for you. You're a drug addict. You're smoking cigarettes. You're hooked on a drug that's really powerful. It's called nicotine. That's all the bad news. Can I give you some good news? The good news is if you... If you stop smoking for three days, six o'clock, three nights from tonight, you are no longer physically hooked on nicotine. It's out of your system. It's gone. It's about two and three quarter days on average. Three days, it's gone. There's no more nicotine in your system. You're no longer physically hooked. Now, during that three days time, if you run up to somebody and you go, just one drag, dude. That's it. Thanks. 
You do that, you got to go another three days because those drugs bond right back up there and they hook you. So I'm going to ask you to do two threes, one of which I'm going to talk about now, and that is stop smoking for three days. Stop smoking for three days, you're no longer a drug addict, and the nicotine is out of your system. During that three days time, my recommendation to you is to flood, absolutely flood, your system with as much liquid as you can get in there. And I'm not talking about Chardonnay and beer. <laughs> I'd like you to get a lot of water in there, and I'd like you to get a lot of fruit juices if you're not diabetic and you can handle it. So you can float these toxins out of your system because when some people stop smoking, they get a little edgy. <laughs> Anybody ever get a little edgy? Yeah. Ornery. Can we use the B word here? Anybody ever get bitchy? <laughs> okay. Even some of the guys. All right. Your body is cleaning itself up. So if somebody calls you on your stuff, you look right at them and you say, I'm getting better. That's exactly what's going on. Most people that go through this program don't deal with that like others do. They just stop on their own. I think it's because they take me up on the situation of flooding their system, over, especially over the next three days, and also by listening to your tape, which I'll tell you about later. Nicotine takes three days to go out of your system. You're no longer a drug addict. That doesn't mean you won't think about them, and that doesn't mean you won't want one. What it does mean is you're no longer physically hooked. That's why I start with patterns, because patterns are extremely strong. If you don't think so, think about a belief system that you own right now that nobody can change your mind about. Now, having done a talk show in the past, I can tell you the talk show topics that you can just throw out there any day of the week are gun control, birth control, capital punishment, abortion. Any day of the week you can throw that topic out on a talk show and this camp's going to come in and this camp's going to come in. It's going to be like the Arabs and the Israelis. It goes like this. It never stops. There is no argument powerful enough to end the argument. So you own some of those beliefs. They're called patterns. You didn't come out of your mother's womb with an affinity towards a certain position on gun control. Your brain formed the pattern over time to the point where you're ready to stand up and fight for whatever that is. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just showing you how it works. So that's how strong patterns are. Smoking is a pattern. And it's associated with a lot of things. What goes together with a cigarette? Coffee. Coffee. Hell, I mean, that's like Ozzy and Harriet. You know, Will and Grace. Driving in the car. What else? Wine. Oh, yeah. White or red? White. Yeah, white wine. Beer. On the phone. After supper. After whatever. Yeah, okay. I, you can fill in the blank. Uh, of course, the other one that goes together, a cigarette and a glass of milk. No, that doesn't go for you? All right, if that doesn't go for you, the next time you stop and get your coffee, pick up a few extra non-dairy creamers, put it in your pocket, they'll never miss them. Feel a craving for a cigarette, come on, open that non-dairy creamer up, pop it into your mouth. That taste will chase the thought out of your mind. Your brain doesn't put the two of them together. Some people do, but most don't. All right, so one three I'm going to ask you about is to stop smoking for three days, get these drugs out of your system, specifically nicotine. That's one thing. Now, how are we going to help you with the patterns? We're going to use a tool called hypnosis. For those of you that are afraid, anybody afraid? Good. Uh, anybody is afraid? Anybody that's nervous, um, anybody that thinks that they're going to lose control, or if I have some power over you, I got news for you. If I had power over you, I would own my own island, and I, I'd have it populated with dancing girls. They would do the hula all day long. 
I know myself well enough. I mean, it's a shortcoming, I'll admit, but if I had power over people, I don't have any power over you. I have watched each and every one of you in this room go in and out of a trance five to seven times already since you've been here. You go in and out of them all day long, a hundred times a day. You just call it different stuff. Do you ever daydream? Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's a trance. Ever talk to yourself? My God, I better get this done. If I don't get this done, I'm, you know, I'm going to be behind schedule. And we got, you know. That's called being in a trance. You ever drive down the highway, go right by your exit, wonder where you've been for the last half hour? It's called highway hypnosis. You go away, and then you come back. You go away, and then you come back. You go away, and then you come back. I watch you go away. I go watch you process what I'm having to say. I watch you go in there, have a little conversation with yourself. I'm not sure if that's right. I don't believe that. And uh, I can almost hear them up here, but I can see you do it. And I watch you. I watch everybody. <coughs> what you may not know is when you go away, whether you're talking to yourself or daydreaming or whatever, you're a little bit more suggestible than you normally are. Where are the married folks? You married together? You two married? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Where is a married couple? Right here. Okay. What's your first name? Lorena. Lorena? And your first name? Bob. Bob. Okay, Bob and Lorena. So I feel like Jack and Diane's coming up. That, you know that song? Um, Lorena, we're going to pretend here, okay? It's Friday night, and there's a brand new restaurant in town that's opening up that you want Bob to take you to. If you're like most women, Lorena, you're not going to tell him till Friday. I don't know why that is, but it's the way it works, right? But... You get home first on Friday, and then you look out the window and you see him coming up the path. We're making this up, all right? You notice that he's got a little steam coming out of his ears. Have you ever seen Bob with some steam coming out of his ears? Two Friday yeah, nights ago. Yeah, two Friday nights ago. Okay, so you got, a, you got a little history with this. So she's a woman. She's resourceful. She knows that she can't go right up to him and ask to take her to the restaurant. Because women, I don't know what it is about you, but you got your wily ways. You go over the top, you go around the side, you go underneath, you wiggle. I don't know how you do it, but you do it. She is not going to approach him at that point. A guy would approach you. A guy would come up to you and go, well, come on, let's go. Well, why not? How come we can't go? And, bah, 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 and you want to hit him, okay? <laughs> Guys don't know what women know. Women know how to go around the corner and over the top. So there's what she does. And again, I'm making this up. You'll go along. She sees the steam. She still wants to go to the rest. Oh, Bob, looks like you had a tough day, honey. Come on, tell me about it. Just sit down in that chair. Take it easy. Can I get you a beverage from the refrigerator? You want to take your shoes off? Oh, maybe you need a shoulder rub. Tell them, oh, poor baby. They said that to you? They did that? Okay, it's about a half hour later now. She knows the steam is down about here, and she says, there's a new restaurant in town. I'd like you to take me. Will you do that? What are your chances then versus a half hour before? A lot better. A lot better. That's what I do. I learn from the women. You set up a frame. That's all I'm doing. I'm setting up a frame where you're a little bit more suggestible. That's all. And how I do that is with a tool called hypnosis. And this is a technical term exactly what I'm going to do. If it hasn't happened for you already, I'm going to bore you to tears. <laughs> That's my job. I'm going to tell you a story about going to the beach. Did I tell the beach story 20 years ago when I was here? Yeah, you've heard the beach story? Okay. These folks have been here before. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, clouds and blue sky and sand and I'm going to talk about, uh, oh God, seagulls. I might even talk about seagull crap. I haven't made up my mind yet. And you know what's going to happen? You folks are going to pay attention because you're saying, my God, this must be important. Or he wouldn't be talking about seagulls and he wouldn't talk about ocean and waves and all this stuff. 
It's not important. I'm telling you that up front. It's not. But you're going to think you should be listening. And then you know what's going to happen? You're going to go away from me. I'm going to throw you out a hook. And you're going to go away. Then you're going to come back to me. Then I'm going to throw you out another hook. And then you're going to go away. Then you're going to come back. You're going to go away and come back. I'm going to be here the whole time talking to you. But you're going to drift away from me and come back. Every time you go away, you're a little bit more suggestible than you normally are. And I'm going to be suggesting to you the whole time. Um, for example, don't pay attention to any of the stories that I tell you here tonight, because I just make them up. And they probably have nothing to do with you. But is there anybody in here besides me who wore some goofy clothes when they were a teenager that they wouldn't be caught dead in today? Where are you? Okay. Probably nobody in this group ever had their heart broken when they were a teenager. Oh, you did? Yeah. What would have happened if you had married that person? Yeah, be another one of your first wives, right? You'd have stabbed them in their sleep. Yeah, I know. Something that was so important to you, you outgrew. How the heck did that happen? There's a part of your brain that knows how to update itself. That's the part of you that we're working with. Now, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in a little bit, and I'm going to say stuff to you like, your arms are getting heavy. I never say that in the weight loss group. <laughs> if I say your arms are getting heavy, guess what? Your arms may not feel heavy. It's only a suggestion. Only a suggestion. If I say your toes are tingling, your toes may not be tingling, but you know what's going to happen? You can be there with your eyes closed going, you know, he says, my toes are tingling. I don't feel my toes tingling. I think I want to open my eyes and peek and see if somebody else's toes are tingling. <laughs> Those toes, they look like they're tingling. They must be getting it. I'm not getting it. $49.95 and my toes aren't tingling. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, it's only a suggestion. You are not going to take every one that I give you. You'll take, enough of, you'll take enough of them that these ideas will get through to you and then we'll show you how to reinforce them so they get stronger and stronger and become part of you. Now, we talked about patterns earlier, and let me show you how your patterns register with you, especially when somebody has a different point of view than you do or they suggest something to you that you think is a little weird or foreign. You get a little thing that runs across the midline, down the midline, from your throat all the way down to your bowels. That's where you feel your feelings. So if you feel flushed, or your heart pitter-patters, or your stomach gets in a knot, or good feelings, they all register along here. Now I've talked to you about patterns since we got here. Watch your patterns when I make this next suggestion to you. Just watch them come up, because it's going to come up. You're going to get a response to what I'm about to say. And I didn't make this up. People, thousands of people, just like yourself, has suggested to me, John, when I do this, it makes it feel better. I heard it from a handful of people. I heard it from hundreds, and I ignored it. Then I heard it from thousands. I said, this can't be wrong. So thousands of people have told me, what I'm about to suggest to you will make this experience feel better. Okay? I know that it does, because I've done it. I'm going to make the suggestion to you, but watch your patterns come up. Watch some of you just go, oh my God. Okay. To enhance this experience, to make it feel better, I'm going to suggest that you pick a spot somewhere on the floor and stretch yourself flat on your back. Now, the good news is there's not room for everybody. The bad news is there's not room for everybody. We're going to find out who the adventurers are. Let's go.
Go ahead, find yourself a spot. Prime real estate up on the stage. That's it. Let me just slide by you. God, if I could have done this when I was a teenager, I'll tell you, I'd have had the world. How come I didn't learn this when I was a kid? I get my back aches. There you go. We'll get it working. Slide on back. Stretch yourself all the way out. Go ahead. Excuse me. I'm going to get right by you here. My God, it's almost like the United Way, almost 100%. It's not necessary to get on the floor. It does enhance the experience. I just wanted you to notice your pattern's coming up. Did you notice that some of you went, there ain't no way in hell I'm getting down on that floor. <laughs> That's a pattern. That's all that is. You didn't come out of your mother's womb saying, I won't lay on the floor at the hypnosis seminar. So we're going to get started here. A uh, couple of ground rules. If you need to cough, you can cough. If you need to scratch, you can scratch. If you need to open your eyes and peek, you can open your eyes and peek. There are no rules. There is nothing to get. All I'm going to ask you to do is listen to me talk to you, and you won't be able to stay with me. Oh, you'll try, because it must be important, me, him talking about seagull crap. <laughs> it must be important, but you won't be able to stay with me. It doesn't matter. But if you're seated, I'd like you to uncross yourself and unfold yourself and put your hands on your lap. And if you're lying down, go for it. Stretch your body out. There you go. Okay, folks. Let's start off nice and easy and take a nice deep breath. Exhale slowly. And please close your eyes. And with your eyes, comfortably closed, I invite you to listen to the sound of my voice. And with your eyes comfortably closed as you lie on the floor or sit on your chair and feel the support of the floor or the chair beneath you, your body and your mind at their own pace, unwind, relax, let go, whatever those words mean to you. And the good news is it's not necessary to try because there's a part of your mind that knows how to relax without you knowing how that happens. And right now, as you continue to listen to the sound of my voice, and as you continue to feel the support of the floor or the chair beneath you, I invite you to notice your breathing. Notice how it comes in, Notice how it goes out. Notice how your stomach feels when you breathe. Notice what your chest feels like when you breathe. And before I mentioned your breathing, you may not have been aware of it. And now that I've mentioned it, Maybe you're a little more aware of your breathing than you were a moment ago. That's called a suggestion. 
And you may not have noticed that you swallow two to three times a minute. And before I mention swallowing, you may not have even been thinking about it. And you may be now. And right now I'd like you to take a little trip with me. I like to take my trip on a beach. Actually it was a beach I was quite familiar with at one time. It was in a place called Ocean City, New Jersey. Now it could have been Ocean City, Maryland, but it was Ocean City, New Jersey. And I like a beach on which to take this trip because there are so many interesting and fascinating things on which to focus your attention. For example, I like the sound of the surf. I find the ocean sound to be magical, whether in the morning, the afternoon, the evening, whenever. And I like to look down at the waves and watch them roll in, one right after the other. And I like to look up and see the thick, white, fluffy clouds and the deep blue sky. And you can feel your weight shifting as you walk through the warm sand. And if you look up, you might see a seagull flying by and then hovering over the beach coming down and landing, doing the goofy seagull walk. And maybe even see the seagull fight over a french fry with another seagull. And it's one of those special times in your life, seeing as this is just a fantasy, that you have the beach all to yourself. <coughs> Something that probably never happens in real life, but it's your imagination. And I invite you to walk down towards the water's edge in your mind's eye. Down towards the wet or the tideland sand. And as you do this, you begin to notice a difference. You begin to notice a change. The sand becomes firm and cold and damp beneath your feet. And if you look down, you might notice that a wave has rolled up around your feet and ankles. And if you watch carefully, you'll watch it roll right back out to sea. And if you look down again, you may notice that that wave left something behind. Some foam. And if you carefully look at that foam, and you stretch your imagination out just a little bit, you might notice that that foam resembles a lace tablecloth. <laughs> And reach down in your mind's eye and draw the number five in the sand. Five. Five. And as you look down at that number five, you may begin to notice a special sensation beginning in your feet. Now I don't know which foot it'll begin in first. Some people report a very heavy feeling. Some people talk about a very light feeling. Some people talk about a tingling or a numbness. Some others talk about warmth or cold. Whatever is going on in your feet right now, notice it and appreciate it. 
it's your own sense of relaxation. And it will move at its own pace without you trying throughout your entire body when it's good and ready. It'll move through your feet, right up into your ankles, on up into your calves, through your shins, right up into your knees. And beginning tonight, and each and every day in the future, part of your mind associates that number five with a feeling of relaxation from your knees to your toes. And with a little practice, you'll be able to relax by the countdown numbers. And a wave just comes along and washes away the number five. And you draw the number four in the sand. Four. And as you look down at that number four, that feeling of relaxation moves up behind the backs of your knees, on up into your thighs, right up into your hips. All those muscles in your hips relaxing, letting go. And that feeling moves right up into your buttocks muscles. That's right, even your butt muscles can relax now. And beginning this evening and each and every day in the future, part of your mind associates that number four with a feeling of relaxation from your buttocks to the backs of your knees. And with a little practice, you'll be able to relax by the countdown numbers. And a wave just washes away that number four. And you draw the number three in the sand. And as you look down at that number three, that feeling of relaxation goes deep into your groin, on up into your abdomen, your stomach muscles, your chest muscles relaxing now. And that feeling of relaxation in your stomach moves round and through the small of your back, on up to your spine, all the way up. All those tiny little muscles along your spine relaxing. And beginning tonight, and each and every day in the future, part of your mind associates that number three with a feeling of relaxation throughout your entire torso. And with a little practice, you'll be able to relax by the countdown numbers. And a wave just washes away the number three. And you draw the number two in the sand, two. And as you look down at that number two, that feeling of relaxation goes deep through your shoulders, downward through your upper arms, through your elbows, your forearms, your wrists, your hands, your fingers. And you can allow any tension to drain right off your fingertips, just like a warm shower drains off your fingertips. And you can let any upsets, any cares, concerns, worries, or woes just drip away. 
and beginning tonight and each and every day in the future, part of your mind associates that number two you've drawn with a feeling of relaxation from your shoulders all the way down to your fingertips. And with a little practice, you'll be able to relax by the countdown numbers. And a wave just washes away that number two. And you draw the number one in the sand. One. As you look down at that number one, notice the calm, peaceful feelings in your mind that you can associate with the number one. And also allow that feeling of relaxation to move upward through the muscles of your neck, on up underneath the scalp. All those tiny little muscles under your scalp relaxing downward across your forehead, across your eyes, facial muscles, mouth, jaw, relaxing. And beginning tonight, and each and every day in the future, part of your mind associates that number one with a feeling of mental calmness and also with a sense of relaxation from your neck upward. And with a little practice, you'll be able to relax by the countdown numbers. And a wave just washes away the number one. And you walk back up onto the warm sand. And as you do this, you notice a difference a change. The sand is warmer beneath your feet. And you draw a giant circle in the sand, like a large zero. And you step inside that circle and you stretch your body out. And you can feel the warmth of the sun radiating downward. And you can feel the warmth of the sand radiating upward. And as you breathe in, you relax even more deeply. And as you exhale, you relax even more deeply. And no matter how deeply you relax now, part of your mind is listening, recording, utilizing, soaking up any and every valuable suggestion that I offer you and that you offer yourself. Because you've made a decision. You've made a decision in your life. You have given yourself the freedom and the opportunity to outgrow the old way and grow into a new way. You've decided to be smoke free. You've decided to leave cigarettes and tobacco behind because you've made up your mind. You've decided it's time. No one is making you do this but you. You've made a choice. And as a non-smoker, you'll be able to manage your weight, whether you choose to lose weight or remain the same. You decide. You've made up your mind. You've given yourself the freedom and the opportunity to be smoke-free. Here's the best news. The best news is, if the thought of smoking or tobacco comes to mind, it will leave your mind again instantly. If the thought or urge to smoke comes to mind, it will immediately leave your mind. And there's a reason for that. It's because those things which in the past used to trigger thoughts and feelings for smoking and cigarettes, those things begin now to trigger feelings of being calm and collected and smoke-free. That's right. 
the very same things which in the past had you think about or desire smoking and cigarettes, those very same things begin now to trigger feelings of being calm, collected, and smoke-free. And each time you listen to the tape you received, you'll reinforce these ideas and they'll become stronger and stronger and become a part of you. Just like your middle name is a part of you, you don't have to think about that. It's right there because you've made it a part of you. And these ideas are becoming a part of you because you've made up your mind to use your mind more than your mouth. You've decided that the pattern of smoking no longer is who you are today. It's who you used to be. You've decided to update your files. You've decided to do some house cleaning inside your own mind and bring your files up to date so they represent who you are today versus who you used to be. In the past, it was very appropriate for you to be a smoker. You've outgrown the need to smoke. In the past, you wanted to be somebody who you weren't, and your mind built you a pattern and let you do that. And now you've decided to outgrow the old way and grow into a new way. And let me offer you the best suggestion once again. The best suggestion is this, because it's absolutely 100% accurate. If the thought of smoking comes to mind, it will leave your mind again. If the thought of smoking comes to mind, it will leave. If the thought of smoking or cigarettes or tobacco of any sort pops into your mind, it'll pop right out again. It'll be easy for you this time, using your mind more than your mouth. And if you choose to manage your weight, you'll be able to do that as well. And the reason it's going to be easier for you this time is because those things which in the past used to cause you to think about or desire smoking and cigarettes, those very same things, whatever they are, begin now to trigger feelings of being calm, collected, and smoke-free. And when you're calm and collected, you make more valuable choices. And each time you make a more valuable choice, it becomes stronger and stronger and a part of you. Remember, it's your idea. You've decided. You're smoke-free because you've made the choice. You've given yourself the freedom. And when you feel that you've done enough work this time around, I invite you to find your way back to your chair. Um, did anybody fall asleep? Did anybody see God? No. Oh, darn. I was hoping that was going to happen. Anybody float up around the top of the room? They're usually the weirdos. <laughs> Did anybody hear my voice sort of drift in and out like a fading radio signal? It didn't. You were drifting in and out. Okay. Did anybody feel their toes or their feet get warm or cold? Hot? Anybody in the room get extra cold? Anybody got warm? Who got warm? A few of you, yeah. Uh, did anybody hear me say lace tablecloth? Who thought of a lace tablecloth? Which one was it? Which one? Yeah, did you think of a specific one? Which one? Tell me. The one that used to be in your grandmother's table. Is it still in the family? I believe it is still. It's still in the family. And remember the year that somebody spilled some cranberry juice on it at Thanksgiving or something and they had trouble cleaning it? No. Here I go throw a goofy hook out called lace tablecloth. And what does she do? She goes off and thinks about it. And she's thinking about her grandma and the grandma's tablecloth. And 
I throw out one little hook and you go away from me. Start thinking about grandma's tablecloth. I start talking about seagulls, you think of seagulls. Then you think about your own stuff. I wonder if everything's okay at home. You know, I wonder what I'm going to be doing this weekend. I wonder if this is working. Am I getting this? Yeah. The key for these ideas to get through, the key for these ideas to become a part of you, what's your middle name? Bill. F. Did you notice it? Name yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's right there, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to go off and think about it. And you can say, John, I'll get back to you in five minutes, right? <laughs> the key to making this stuff long term effective is to pack it away. And here's what I mean by that if you have the ability to learn arithmetic, <laughs> you can stop smoking forever and never think about them. Because that's the whole objective here is to be smoke free, not to think about them, not to want them, to outgrow them. If you can learn arithmetic, you can learn this program. If you were like me when I was a little kid, you did the times table in class, do you recall? Out loud, you know, one times one is one, two times, whatever. Do you remember doing that? Who was good in math, anybody? Good, we'll use you. Uh, could I have the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, we're on, right? Okay. What's your first name? Lorraine. Lorraine. Okay, Lorraine. If you were anything like me, you learned the times table in school and you repeated them over and over again. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know there are a lot of nice people in this room because I've been to Binghamton a million times. You are some of the nicest people on the planet Earth and I've been all over. You really are very caring people. All of you caring people, do not help Lorraine, okay? As much as you want to help her, you will hinder her if you open your mouth, so don't help her. Lorraine, when you were a little girl, you learned the times table, right? And what's your middle name? Beverly. Beverly, and you notice there was no conscious thought that went into that, right? Okay. How, I'm gonna throw you out a stimulus. I want your first response, and I want it that quick. Three times nine. 27. Very good. 5 times 8. 40. 40. 12 times 11. Don't help her. 132. Excellent. You get it quicker than most. Thank you. What happened here? What happened with Lorraine? She memorized that. Not only did she memorize it, she didn't have to consciously think about it. But guess what happened? When she was a little Lorraine, she didn't pack away the 11 times table or the 12 times table. Hardly anybody did. You did the work down here till you own it today. When you got up here, you learned all the tricks. 12 times 12, that's 144. Of course, if I minus 12 from that, 2 from 4 is 132. Or 12 times 10 is 120. If I add 12 to that, everybody knows the 10's time, David. You add, okay? If you've got to work this thing called smoking out consciously, you will go back and smoke cigarettes. If that thought is that wide, if it takes you that long to figure out 12 times 11, in that short gap that it took her, you will entertain the idea of smoking again. What you want to have happen is to have these non-smoking, smoke-free thoughts come to you as quickly as your middle name, as quickly as three times nine, as quickly as five times eight. Otherwise, you're going to be dealing with this thing the rest of your life. And how you make these ideas come quicker is the exact same way you learn the arithmetic tables. You do it over and over and over again. Each one of you received a cassette tape that's part of our program. If you listen to this tape, you will be smoke free. If you don't, I have no guarantees for you. There is a program. Remember I said earlier there are two threes I was going to ask you about. Three number one is stop smoking for three days so you're drug free and I'm no longer talking to a bunch of drug addicts, nor is anybody else. You'll be drug free. The second three I'm going to ask you to do 
is to listen to your tape once per day for the next three weeks of your life. 21 days in a row. I don't care if you're going on vacation, I don't care what you're doing, take it with you. Once a day for three weeks. Why three weeks? It takes three weeks to form a new habit. Don't believe me, I could be making that up. You go home tonight, rearrange all your furniture and get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom, see what happens. <laughs> If you pack these ideas away to you, they'll come to you that quickly and you won't think about it. It's no different than anything you've outgrown already. We were talking about goofy clothes you wore as a teenager that you wouldn't be caught dead in today, but you wore them then, didn't you? You outgrew them and you don't even know how because there's a part of your mind that learns without knowing how. And hypnosis is something that just taps right into that part of your mind and I need your help to reinforce that so it becomes a part of you become stronger and stronger and a part of you. If you have the ability to learn arithmetic, you can learn this program. It's that simple. It's not complicated. I'm not asking you to chew Nicorette gum and I'm not asking you to do any of that stuff. That's not effective. What I'm asking you to do is what you already know how to do is update your files. Learn <laughs> something new. And you can do that if you pack it away. That's why you received the tape. Now, a lot of people say, John, can I listen to the tape in my car? Well, the first words on the tape are, please close your eyes. <laughs> I mean, it could be hazardous to your health. I mean, if you turn the accessory key on and you sit in the passenger seat, I think that's okay. Make the time to do it. Uh, women like to do things in groups. Even if you don't have people, invite somebody else to listen to the tape with you. Uh, all night long I've been talking about you learn without knowing how. Have you heard me say that? And you've heard me say that when you daydream you're in a trance and when you talk to yourself you're in a trance. What's your name back here? Yeah. What is it? Rhonda. Come on up here Rhonda. Rhonda, I need your help. Can you stand in front of the uh, podium? Okay. Do you know how to daydream with your eyes open? Yes, I do. She knows how to daydream with her eyes open. We're going to make her prove it to us, and we're going to do an exercise. Okay, Rhonda? Okay. Okay. Here's the deal, Rhonda. Do you own a pet? Yes. Dog, cat, snake? Cat. Oh, cat? Okay. Can you imagine that cat is sitting right on the floor? Yep. Okay. So Rhonda can daydream with her eyes open. Now, Rhonda, we're going to do something else now. We're going to get you to daydream with your eyes open about something else. Your job is to watch Rhonda. You may be tempted to watch me. I think it has something to do with the pink tie. I'm not sure. But your job is to watch Rhonda because I'll be asking you for a report. Now, Rhonda, this time I'm going to ask you to daydream about something else. Okay. All right? And here's the good news. You don't have to tell me or anybody else in this room what you're daydreaming about. You can get as wild as you want in there, okay? But I need permission to touch you on that shoulder from time to time. Is that okay? Yes. You sure? Just like that. Yeah, okay. No. All right, so Rhonda, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to daydream about a time in your life with your eyes wide open when things were really going swell for you, Rhonda, I mean they were really looking good. They were sounding good. Oh, and somebody might have been saying something to you made you feel real nice, and we won't ask what it was, and we certainly won't ask about those feelings, but you can feel them right now, can't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of our business what's going on in there, but you're having a good time, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, we won't ask. Once again, Rhonda, I'd like you to Take a look at what was going on in that time of your life. Oh, man, it looked wonderful. Oh, and that's what they said to you. Oh, God, those words, they just drove you nuts, right? Oh, and the feelings. Oh, we don't even want to talk about the feelings, how good they were. You can remember that, right? Oh, good. Pay attention to Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, I'm going to ask you to um, think about another time in your life. Something annoying. Um... Uh, I don't even think we need this. Let's turn this off. Um, 
like a guy came by, splashed you with water or something, and you were wet all day at work, something on the scale of that. You can see what that looks like, right? That's not as bright. Doesn't sound so good when you're talking to yourself about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it feels like, yeah, right? Okay, I mean, we've all got times like that. Of course, what I've asked Rhonda to do, if you're paying attention, is I've asked her to think about a time in her life when things were kind of looking up. And, oh man, somebody was saying something to her and it was really cool. And she had some great feelings that we won't ask about. And we'll never pry. Okay, and we've all had times like that. Then I've asked her to think about or daydream about another time in her life when, oh, I don't know, didn't look that bright, didn't sound that good, didn't feel that great. Everybody's got a couple minutes like that. Of course, you know, there are other times in Rhonda's life when things were looking up and sounding good and absolutely feeling great. Yeah. I don't know. Who even wants to talk about those times? I'm kind of curious what you notice about my pal Rhonda. What'd you notice? One side she laughed, one side she didn't. What else? Looking up on one side, looking down on the other side. What else? My voice. Okay, Lorraine, you're supposed to pay attention to her, not me. <laughs> very good. Oh, I like it. Okay. So, Rhonda, you came up here to learn um, something without knowing that you learned it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you guess. You've already learned it. Would you like to see what you learned? Would you like to see what she learned? Yes. Okay, before we show you that, let's talk about what happened here. You daydreamed with your eyes open. I didn't have to ask you what was going on, but you had a daydream, right? Okay. Yeah. And her intellect, when I was doing whatever I was doing, was saying, what the hell's he doing, right? Yeah, it's a little Yeah, basically, <laughs> you're in there. I don't care about your intellect. That's not the part of you that learns, okay? So would you like to see what you learned? Yes. Yeah, oh, good. Rhonda, I'll tell you what I'd like you to do right now. I want you to think about that real shitty time in your life. Go ahead, Rhonda, anytime you're ready, dear. Go ahead, you get into that real crap, the muck and the mire. Get down there. Oh, I mean, gnashing of teeth, tears. As soon as you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Anytime you're ready. I mean, just get down into the crud. Yes, that's it. Let's get down into the mud. Go ahead. Soon as you're ready. I'm trying. Oh, yeah. I'm, anytime you're ready, it's okay. You take your time. We got all night. Go ahead. I mean, it was a real crappy time, remember? Yeah. <laughs> Have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Basically, what you just witnessed is somebody building a new pattern that quickly. That quickly. All she did is she a part of her brain associated a posture that I had, a tone of voice, very good, Lorraine, that I had, and also a touch. I associated three things with a, uh, with a daydream she was having. I went over here and had bleh, and I came back over here. Did you watch her change as I walked yeah. back and forth? Her intellect was going, what's he doing, what's he doing, what's he, like your intellect, what's he doing? I wonder if this is going on. There's stuff getting in here. These stories that I'm telling you about heartbreak and spring cleaning and all that crap, don't pay attention to them. Couldn't possibly have anything to do with why you're here. See, this stuff gets through. What you have to do is reinforce it so it becomes stronger and stronger and a part of you. If they can take goofy German shepherds, for God's sakes. Pavlov put out some food for the German shepherds. He put out the food, he watched them salivate, and he rang a bell. He put out more food, he watched them salivate, he rang a bell. He put out more food, watched them salivate, he rang a bell. You know what that tricky son of a gun did next? He just rang the bell. No food. Guess what happened? The dogs started to salivate. Not only that, the dogs had a part of their brain that knew how to update itself because then they started to salivate when they heard the key going into the lock of the cages. Then they started to salivate when they heard the footsteps coming down the hallway before the key. 
And then they started to salivate at a certain time of day. Maybe the term lunchtime has just taken on a whole new significance for you. Did you ever eat lunch because it was lunchtime? Yeah. Were you hungry? No. Anybody ever been on a cruise? Man, it's lunchtime all the time on the cruise. Good Lord. All right. We're going to do this again. Uh, this time everybody's going to stay in their seat unless you're hell-bent on getting on the floor. I, I, it's easy. Uh, this time around, we're going to work on your self-image. Remember I told you earlier that people said to me, uh, John, when I do this, it makes it feel better. There's an exercise I'm about to do to work on your self-image that people have asked me to put together a lecture series and a cassette tape about. I've heard it from too many people, and I finally took them up on their suggestion. And if you want a copy of it, you can see Mr. Leslie on the way out. It's called Self-Image, A Picture is Worth a Thousand Pep Talks Squared. Okay? Because pictures drive what it is that you deserve, that you think you deserve, and things that you get. It's not your chit-chat. You're never, ever going to talk yourself into what you want. If any of you have ever used this phrase, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. May I curse? Horseshit. <laughs> it doesn't work. It will never work. You can sit there till you're 108 and say that goofy phrase and it's not going to work for you. Because you're never ever going to talk yourself into what it is that you're going to do. You can picture yourself there, but you can't talk yourself into it. I'm sorry. Because talk moves at the speed of sound. Sound moves at 1,100 feet per second, 1,200 feet per second. The speed of light, the speed of pictures, moves at 186,000 miles per second. It's a picture that drives you. It is not chit-chat. I was telling somebody on the way in, I think it was Fred, about Max, was it you or somebody else? No, it was, I can't remember who it was. Uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz. He was a plastic surgeon in the 50s and 60s, well before uh, elective surgery was way out of whack like it is now. And he really did some serious plastic surgery deformities on people, and he was a master. But what he found out was that no matter how good the work he did, no matter how masterful the job is that he did, some of the people didn't recognize the difference. Their family recognized, my God. Their friends recognized, oh my God. The picture showed it in black and white. The colleagues of the doctor, my God, doctor, you're amazing. You've done this wonderful work. But the person didn't notice it. After seeing this replicated thousands of times, Maxwell Maltz got it. These people are carrying around a picture of themselves that doesn't match up with anything external that they're being shown or told. How many of you have had a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, significant other say to you that you look beautiful, you look handsome, and you didn't believe them. You know, yeah. Do you think they were making that up? I mean, they already got what they wanted from you a lot of years before, right? <laughs> they weren't making it up. You didn't buy it. You know why you didn't buy it? Because you don't have a picture of yourself that's updated. So we're going to do this exercise now. Again, uh, if you want a copy of the tape, they're for sale on the way out. I think they're like 1995. It's a lecture series on one side. The other side is a self-induction um, thing that we're going to do right now about bringing you up to date with your self-image. Because, as I told you earlier, whenever you started to smoke, that's where your development got arrested in that portion of your brain. If you were 15, the part of you that smokes is still 15. It's time to bring it up to date. Okay? So, if you can just sit where you are, put your hands on your lap, unfold yourself, uncross yourself. There you go. 
Would you take a nice deep breath, please? Exhale slowly. And please close your eyes. And with your eyes comfortably closed, keeping your eyes deliberately closed with the same deliberateness, I want you to roll your eyes up to the top of your head until you feel just a little bit of eye strain. I want you to feel your eyes strain. You can relax your eyes. And once again, just notice your breathing. By the way, any time of the day or night when you need a mental health break, when you need the world to go away, take a nice deep breath. Exhale slowly, close your eyes, and just pay attention to your breathing. Don't try and control it, just notice it. Notice how it comes in, how it goes out. Notice how your stomach feels. Notice how your chest feels. And just by doing that simple exercise, any time of the day or night, you can relax and feel more comfortable. Right now, I'd like you to take a little excursion in your own mind. Back, all the way back to when you were five years old. Five. And I would like you to get a sense of what you looked like when you were five. Now, some of you may exactly remember from a picture some of you may have a memory so good or a picture so vivid in your mind that you can recall. For some it will be unclear, but you'll have a sense. Right now the important thing is to pursue the exercise and get a sense of what you looked like when you were five years. And now that you have a sense of what you looked like when you were five, I want you to move yourself up to when you were in the sixth grade. <laughs> sixth grade. What was going on with you in the sixth grade? What did you look like? What were your teeth doing? What was your hair like? What different parts of your body look like when you were in the sixth grade? You might remember, you might remember a picture. Just go for it. Get a sense of what you looked like in the sixth grade. And what I'd like, like you to notice is that there's a difference from when you were five years old. You've changed. And now what I want you to do is move up to when you were 17 years old. 17. And if you're not 17 yet, imagine what you would look like when you were 17. Get a sense of what you look like at 17. What was your hair doing? What kind of clothes were you wearing? What did you look like? Get as clear of a picture as you possibly can. Or a sense of what you look like at 17. And notice you're a lot different than when you were in the sixth grade. And a heck of a lot different than when you were five. Now let's move you up to when you were 28 years old. 28. And if you're not 28, imagine what you would look like when you are 28. Notice that you're different than when you were 17, than when you were in the sixth grade, than when you were five years old. And now what I'd like you to do Come all the way up to however old you are today. 
And I want you to see yourself exactly as you are today. Don't embellish the picture. I want you to see yourself exactly the way you are today, whether it's from a recent photograph or remembering looking in the mirror. Get a sense of exactly what you look like today. And also get a sense that all of these years have gone by and you've brought a lot of experiences with you from when you were five, from when you were in the sixth grade, from when you were 17, 28, and all the way to where you are today. Some of those experiences are very, very valuable. And some of them you need to let melt and fade away. And I think you know the difference between which ones are worth holding on to and which ones aren't. And now that you have a picture of what you look like today, I'd like you to set that aside. Because now what I want you to do is imagine that you're at the most peaceful place on earth for you. And if you don't know where that is, I want you to make it up. I want you to imagine, I want you to see yourself at the most peaceful place on earth for you. For some people that could be at an ocean or mountain stream, in church, in your own bed, you decide where the most peaceful place on earth is for you. And notice when you're there how peaceful your face looks. Notice how your face softens when you're peaceful. How all the hard edges just melt and fade away. Because there's nothing to be upset about. You're just peaceful. Notice what it looks like. And once you have a sense of what it looks like to be peaceful, I want you to add to that image. I want you to add, remember it's your own imagination, you can do anything you want in there because you deserve it. I'd like you to look exactly the way you want to look today. Craft that image in your own mind. Decide right now what it is that you want to look like. In association with putting cigarettes and smoking behind you, maybe you want to notice what you look like, how radiant you look being smoke-free, keeping that peaceful look on your face. Maybe you want to notice how your body looks, being smoke-free. Remember, you can shape it any way you want. And now that you're crafting a whole new image of yourself, keeping a very peaceful look on your face, I want you to bring back that image of yourself as you are today. And I want you to introduce the new you to the old you. Sort of mix them together. Just like you would mix two liquids in a pitcher and stir them up. Let them meet each other for the first time and learn from each other. Learn all the valuable experiences that are worth keeping. And learn all the ones that you can let just melt and fade away. And carry this new picture of you, this peaceful looking you, the way you want to look, the way you want others to see you. Carry it around with you everywhere you go because it will give you confidence. You'll like the way you look and you'll act more confidently just having a picture of yourself, a clear, crisp, colorful, close-up picture of the way you want to be. Carry it with you wherever you go, and it will drive you. It will allow you the freedom to do what it is that you need to do. It will give you the confidence to do the things that you've been unable to do. Just by carrying a, an updated picture of yourself around with you. And regarding why you came tonight, you've decided to be smoke free. You've decided to outgrow the old way and grow into a new way. You've decided. You've given yourself the freedom and opportunity. And here's the best news. The best news is, if the thought of smoking pops
pops into your mind, it'll pop right out again. It'll leave your mind again. Because those things, whatever those things were in the past, which used to trigger thoughts and feelings for smoking and cigarettes, those very same things begin now to trigger feelings of being calm, collected, and smoke-free. And when you're calm and collected, you make a much more valuable choice. And each time you make a more valuable choice, it becomes stronger and stronger and a part of you. And when you feel you've done enough work this time around, just pop your eyes open, please. Anybody ever been to a tobacco field? Yeah? You have? Man, we had Ron and Lorraine, uh, you've both been there, huh? How big are those leaves? How big? Yeah, pretty big. You've been there too? Show me. How big's that leaf? Yeah. See, the tobacco industry, uh, the workers have, the workers who work in the fields have some concerns, and the tobacco industry has other concerns. In the hot days of the summertime, the workers don't like the flies buzzing around. There are a lot of flies in the field. And the flies land on these big leaves. And do you know what the flies do on the leaves? Right. Fly shit. I don't know how to say it any other way. But the tobacco industry doesn't care about flies and fly crap. What they care about is a thing called a sucker worm. Notice I have your attention keeping the room this cold, don't I? Yeah, must be a reason it's so damn cold in here. Um, these sucker worms, they suck on these plants and they ruin the crop. So they spray for the sucker worms. But the sprays get so strong that the bugs have to build up an immunity to it and the bugs get stronger. Then the sprays get stronger and the bugs get stronger and the sprays get stronger and the bugs get stronger till one day people stop smoking. Not everybody. Not everybody. Enough people to make the tobacco industry stand up and take notice. My God, we're losing our smokers left and right. What do we do? So they did what any good business organization would do. I'm sure the Siemens folk would do this as well. If they were losing market share, they'd probably go out and do some focus group. What's going on? The tobacco industry did that. And they brought in thousands of people and asked them, what's going on with you? Why'd you stop? How come you? How come you? How come you? They all told them the same thing in so many words. They said, I'm tasting something awful, something funny, something yeah. However they characterize it, it all revolved around the word taste. Did you ever notice that taste is always in the ads for cigarettes? I, now you might figure that out. So they had to do something about this, and they did. They came up with two inventions. One of them is called the filter. That's the reason the filter was invented, so you didn't get the taste of poison. Rather sweet of them, huh? Didn't care you were getting poisoned, just didn't want you to taste it. The second thing they came up with is something called menthol. Yeah, that was put in there so you didn't get the taste the poison. Again, kind of sweet of them, huh? Yeah. Oh, and notice that they put the real... Isn't it amazing that there's a pack of cigarettes called Cool? Think about that. Cool. I mean, that's a double thing. Not only does it have menthol in there to cover up the taste of the poisons, it also reinforces why you started to smoke in the first place. You were cool. They got you. That's wonderful. Wonderful marketing. Uh, so anyway, we got the leaves, we got the flies, we got the fly crap, we got the sucker worms, we got the sprays. They come and they pick these leaves and they throw them into a piles before they hang them up. And running through those piles, I don't know when you were down there, if you got to see the rats run through. Yeah, and do what rats do in there and then snakes slithering through it. That kind of stuff. That's fun to talk about. And then... <laughs> And then they take these leaves and they oast them out, they dry them out. And then they throw them into the grinder and they get ground up. 
and they get wrapped into papers, glued shut, filters attached if they're filters, menthol added if they're menthol, shipped off to the marketplace to you under a variety of different brand names. I mean, do you think they grow Winston's in one field and Marlboro's in another field? Come on. Oh, this is the Winston field, and this is the Salem field. <laughs> That's a horseshit. Anyway, so they get around and they're stuffed. And guys are famous for this. Guys, you know you do this. You get a new pack of cigarettes out, what do you do? You tamp them. Yeah, that's a guy thing, isn't it? And you get one out, and you light it up, and you go, oh, man, something tasting, something funny. Must have got a stale one. If it were stale, how come the whole pack wasn't stale? wonder what was in that cigarette. Because what that guy was really doing, he was lighting up and sucking in on fly shit and rat urine and then blowing it all around the room so everybody else can have some. Here, have a little fly shit. Any of you have little ones at home? Little ones get ear, nose, and throat things galore. They always do. In a smoker's household, times three. So if you want to feel guilty, feel guilty about that. Times three. If you're smoking in a household with kids, times three ear infections. You know there's enough nicotine in any three cigarettes in this room if injected into your bloodstream, drop you dead on the floor in 10 minutes? Enough nicotine, any three cigarettes, any brand, you'd be dead in 10 minutes if injected into your bloodstream. Mother Teresa could come back from the dead, you'd still be dead in 10 minutes. Who has a cholesterol problem? Anybody? Every cigarette you smoke raises your cholesterol one point. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't come back down, but if you're over or borderline, and you're smoking two, three packs a day, man, that one pack, it's going up 20, 40, 60 points. It's very, very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, I'm not here to scare you, though. That's not my job. My job is to let you know that it takes three days for nicotine to get out of your system. Whatever you got to do to get over that hump, drink a lot of fluids, flush yourself with fruit juices, make that orneriness go away a lot easier than it ever has in the past. Secondly, I'm asking you for three weeks of your life to listen to your tape once a day for three weeks so you pack these ideas away so they come to you as quickly as three times nine. This stuff works, folks. You just got to work at it a little bit. I mean, we've presented this program all around. It's been presented at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. People come in from all walks of life, and people get it. Those that do what I ask them to do get results. Those that don't usually don't. I know Mr. Leslie was right up front with the out front. We want you to get what you came for. I want you to get what you came for. I like people saying nice things about me, just like you do. Here's what drives me nuts. Oh, yeah, well, I tried that stuff. It doesn't work. Oh, well, did you listen to your tape? Nah. Just stop smoking for three days? Nah. I tried that stuff. It doesn't work. That's like going to the doctor and you have strep throat, and he says, take this prescription until it's all gone. You take two pills or no pills, and then you go back two weeks later and you say, I still have strep throat. He said, did you take the pills? And you go, no. Why are you here? I'm going to tell you to do the same thing again. So, speaking of that, you have a tape. Anytime that we're in town, you're invited back. Just bring your tape. We'll let you come back through the doors again. Now, I got one little exercise that uh, I want to do again. Another eyes closed, and then we have a parting ceremony. Um, oh, if your tape should break, if the dog eats it, if it falls into the toilet, make sure you call the toll-free number on there. We'll shoot you out another one in the mail. We want you to be successful. We want you to get what you came for. Now, 
Before we do this next exercise, I need you to come up with a very powerful symbol for yourself. One that's powerful for you. I can suggest them, but an exit sign, that's a symbol. American flag, that's a very powerful symbol for people. A cross is a very powerful symbol for Christians. Um, a Bible, a picture of your kids, a uh, New England Patriots hat, whatever it is, there's something that's powerful for you. I don't know what that is, but I want you to think about a symbol right now that means something to you. Now, we're going to do something tricky. I want you to attach to that symbol, attach right to it, what it is that you want to accomplish by being here tonight. Put the two of them together, marry them. Like, right together. So if I pick the exit sign as my symbol, and I put together with that exit sign exactly what I wanted to accomplish here tonight, every time I saw that exit sign, it would remind me of what I wanted to accomplish. They would be together. Now that you've got a symbol and what you want to accomplish, we can do this exercise. And this is an exercise I invite you to do every night when you go to bed. When you go to sleep, if you're like most people, when's the last time you went to sleep like this? You closed your eyes and you said, you know, the world is really lucky to have me. When's the last time you had that conversation at bedtime? Didn't happen, huh? More like this. Oh, man, that was awful. That was a stupid thing I did today. That was dumb. I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm always going to look like this way. And I'm and they can't talk to me like that. And how dare they? And blah, 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 blah. And don't they care? And don't they know? it? Every night, you grind on yourself. Every night. Do you know that every night on your way to sleep, you drift through a brainwave activity that science calls hypnosis? where you happen to be a little more suggestible than you normally are? What suggestions do you think you're getting reinforced? All the crap that you take to bed with you. I got a whole new way. Once you do your routine, and it's none of my business what your routine is, you do whatever you do. But once you go through that routine and you close your eyes, I want you to bring your symbol to mind and remember, married to your symbol is what you want to accomplish. Once you bring your symbol to mind, either you say it to yourself or make a picture, roll your eyes up till you feel a little eye strain, relax your eyes, and count backwards from five to zero. Now, why is that effective? Because every night of your life, whether you remember it or not, you dream three to four times a night, every night. And how do you know somebody dreams? You see their eyes move rapidly. So we built in a thing that allows you, while you're dreaming three to four times a night, to reinforce what it is that you want to reinforce, rather than taking crud to bed with you. So let's do the exercise. Take a nice deep breath, please. Exhale slowly. And please close your eyes. With your eyes comfortably closed, I invite you to bring to mind that symbol, the one that's powerful for you. Now remember, this symbol, when you were first born, didn't mean anything to you. But it grew in significance as you got older, exposed to it, and told stories about it, or had experiences with it, and it means something to you. That's all that's important. And attached to that symbol now is what it is that you want to accomplish by being here tonight. So with that symbol in mind, whether you say it to yourself or make a picture of it, keeping your eyes deliberately closed, roll your eyes up to the top of your head till you feel just a little eye strain. Now relax your eyes and allow me to count you backwards from five to zero. Now, you'll do this by yourself at bedtime, but I'll walk you through it now. And you may remember that when we went to the beach earlier, we drew the numbers five through zero in the sand. And you may recall that each one of those numbers 
was associated with a feeling of relaxation in a certain area of your body. And you may have heard me say a time or two that you'd be able to relax by the countdown numbers. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Some nights you may not even make it down to two or one or zero before you're off asleep. And while you're asleep, your mind will be reinforcing two to three times a night what it is that you want to accomplish. Because when your eyes roll up, part of your mind will say, hey, there's the symbol. You know what that means. Everything that they want to accomplish. So you get to reinforce and work on what it is that you want to work on every night of your life. And it goes past being smoke-free. But that's the reason you came. You've decided to outgrow the old way and grow into a new way. You've decided you've given yourself the freedom and the opportunity to be smoke-free. The best news, the very best news is this. If the thought of smoking comes to mind, it'll leave your mind again. If the thought of smoking pops into your mind, it'll pop right out again. And the reason for that is simple, that those things, whatever those things were in the past that used to trigger thoughts and feelings for smoking and cigarettes, those very same things begin now to trigger feelings of being calm, collected, and smoke-free. And you know, each time that you're calm and collected, you make a more valuable choice. And each time you make a more valuable choice, it becomes stronger and stronger and a part of you. And right now I'd like the part of you that refreshes you, wakes you up and makes you very receptive and very alert to do that right now. Allow yourself to become alert, and wide awake, very receptive and ready for your ride home. Couple of reminders, then we have a ceremony to do. If you have an interest in a self-image tape, bringing your image up to date, this is very, very effective. It's a great tape. I hate to say that because I did it, but it is. That's also available for you out there. Um, oh, the cameras are here tonight. If you want a copy of this whole thing that we did, workshop for somebody that couldn't come, that's also something that we offer. You can find out about that at the desk. But right now, I need you to get your cigarettes out. Those of you that have cigarettes, get them out. Come on, get them out, get them out, get them out, get them out. If you, can I borrow your pack? Oh, I don't want your thing, I want the pack. Oh, Winston. All right. Folks, we're going to do an exercise. Remember earlier when I asked you to get down on the floor and you said there's no way on God's earth I'm doing that? Remember that feeling that came up, that pattern? This will be ten times worse. Okay, you won't want to do this. And I'm encouraging you to do this. If you do this, it's very powerful. You won't want to do it. I guarantee you won't want to do it. I'm telling you, do it anyway. If you have cigarettes with you, get them out. If you don't have cigarettes with you, I want you to pretend that you have cigarettes with you. I'm going to count to three. When I say one, I'm going to ask you to look down at your pack and notice something about it. The fact that it's an inanimate object and it has no power over you. Now what the heck does inanimate mean? If you look it up in the dictionary, inanimate means no life. Kind of an interesting choice of words, right? No life. Now, that's an inanimate object. This chair is an inanimate object. There's not one of you, not one in this room that would let this chair lead you around by the nose. Not one of you. How many of you let this pack of cigarettes lead you around by the nose? Seriously, think about this. This pack that has no life is running your life. 
you're a slave to that pack of cigarettes, an inanimate object. So when I say one, I want you to look down at your pack, notice something about it, inanimate object has no power over you. John, that's easy. Who can't do that? That's a piece of cake. Oh, I didn't get to number two yet. This is where you're not going to want to do it. When I say number two, what I'm going to ask you to do is to look down at your pack, whether real or imagined, and in your best voice, as loud as you can say it, I want you to look down at that pack and say the words, Good Bye! <laughs> Good Lord, John, that is the stupidest thing you've said tonight. I've heard some dumb shit, but that's the stupidest thing you've said this evening. Why would I want to do that? Well, because some of you have a relationship with this pack of cigarettes longer than you have relationships with people in your lives. <laughs> Guys, keep them next to their heart. Friend, buddy, pal. This is the kind of friend or buddy or pal, every time you turn your back, they jam a knife in there, twist it, get some salt, and push it into the wound. This is the kind of friend or buddy or pal you want to say, see you later to. Then when I say three, I'm going to ask you to crush them in your hand, whether figuratively or literally, and then fire them right up off the front of the stage. <laughs> so would you all stand up, please? Please stand up. One, take a good look at your pack. Notice something about it. Inanimate object has no power over you. We're about to separate the men from the boys and the girls from the women. Two, out loud in your best voice, say the words, goodbye. Three, fire them up there. Throw them up there. <laughs> Folks, if your tape breaks, call our toll-free number. We'll get you a new one out. Please listen to your tape. I'll be a hero. If you don't, I'll be a goat. Thank you for coming. Godspeed.